session. Um, we are first preaching from John 14 this morning, but on the Holy Spirit, but he asked me to read from um, earlier in uh, John. He wants just to introduce a little, a little bit before reading the main, main um, reading. So the first reading will come from John 13, 1 to 8. Uh, John 13, 1 to 8, yes, sorry, that's, that's it. it's a bit of a complicated reading this morning. So, reading from John 13, verses 1 to 8, Jesus washes his disciples' feet. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to, to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus, Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Then we're turning over to John 13, verse 33 and 34. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And the portion that Flo is preaching from this morning, John 14, verse 15 to 27. Jesus promises the Holy Spirit, If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He, loves, he who loves me will be loved by, by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Here ends the reading of God's word. May we be always grateful for it.
sorry, but if I can't see you, it's not because I'm trying to hide away from you. It's just easier for me to sit down. I hope you don't mind. <clears throat> We're back in John's Gospel this morning. And uh, it's like the Lord has made this book, the book that I come back to again and again. And hopefully I'll be able to continue to preach from this book for maybe as long as I'm with you here. I mean, anywhere I can come. And so the last time that we were here together, we looked at the first 14 verses. And um, that this, Jesus has just made known to his disciples that he was about to leave them. And that confused them. I mean, they've been spending all this time with him. And um, they didn't know how to make sense of the fact that he's telling them to leave them. And as we try to make sense of that this morning, let's ask him for his help. Father, we thank you that your word is open before us. And yet we are often so dull. And we pray that by your wonderful spirit, you will come and open our minds to see the truths and what they mean to us and should mean to us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So, <clears throat> Jesus makes it clear that him going away is for a very good purpose. He's going to make it possible for them to be with him forever. And he has to go via the cross in order to do that. Now they've been with him for three and a half years and they can't understand what life is going to be like without him. You know, some of you, I'm thinking of Val now, that have been with JJ and some of us, we be with our loved ones, maybe our life partner, and then all of a sudden we hear that they're not going to be there or they're not there. There's a loss. But Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come back to you. And the way that he's going to come back to them, that's what we're going to look at this morning. And so, that's where we were last time. It brought sort of all sorts of questions to the disciples. And um, which we looked at, Jesus answered those questions. And the section this morning, it will help me if I get these on. Eh? What do you think? I'll be able to see my writing here. Yeah, okay, that's better. <coughs> the second part of his teaching, he's busy teaching his friends, his disciples, and uh, many of them have put their faith in them, in Jesus. They've come to see him as God's promised Messiah, God's son, or God this son. And yet, there were some of them, one of them in particular, that betrayed him. Another one that denied him three times. And that is an encouragement to me that as you look at God's people, they're not perfect, are they? If you're not perfect, put up your hand. I won't look. <laughs> but I was saying to the crowd before we prayed this, this morning, as God's children is a motherly lot, aren't they? And yet he loves us to bits. Now, in this section before us, he starts off with this statement. Jesus declares, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Which brings us to our first point this morning. Love Jesus by obeying his teaching. Love him by obeying his teaching. A lot of people say they love Jesus. But Jesus says, so if you love me, you will be obeying my teaching as a way of life. Now we need to understand these words of Jesus. If you love me, you will keep my commandments against the background that Sally read to us earlier on. Chapter 13, he says this. It was just before the Passover feast. That time when, remember, blood was put by the Jews on a doorpost. And when the angel of death came, he would pass by. Yeah? 
Now they celebrated, the Jews celebrated that yearly. And it's just before that, that Jesus and his disciples were having a meal together that's known as the Last Supper. And Jesus, knowing the Bible says that he's come, his time has come for him to go back to his father. The Bible says that he loved his own who were in the world, talking particularly here of the twelve disciples. And now he was gonna buy, he was about to show them them his full the full extent of his love. I was with a young couple yet um yesterday and um, they've got a three month old baby and the husband said these words to me that really touched me he said when I witnessed the birth of my child it you showed me an extent of love from her that I could have never have realized otherwise if you've seen a mother with a child, you'll see love in action, don't you? Selfless, sacrificial love. And sometimes we as men can just stand by and say, wow. Now one such time that Jesus showed that his love, that what was in him, for, in his heart for uh, his disciples, was when that occasion when he washed the disciples' feet. You see, there was a lot going on at that time. As already as I said, an indication of the Passover feast, and there's a lot of arrangements that went around that. But early on, the disciples of Jesus, his friends, he found them, they were arguing among themselves, who was among them is going to be the greatest in his kingdom? And Jesus was listening to this. And this is on the eve of him to be crucified. And so sometime during the course of the meal, Jesus got up, took a towel, poured out some water, and he started washing the disciples' feet. And when he came to Peter, Peter says, uh-uh, you're not going to do that. You're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you'll have no part with me. For this was only later, after all that happened in that week ahead of that, when Jesus was crucified, when he rose again, when the Spirit came sometime later, it's only after all of that that the, what Jesus was saying came home to the disciples. That unless his blood washed away their sins, they can have no part of him. They will in fact die in their sins. They will perish. They will die with their sins unforgiven. And that is true for all of us. If we want to go there, we must be able to sing in truth. Your blood has washed away my sins. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath has been completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. It's the cross. That made that possible. And the disciples will only see it once all of that has taken place. That the food washing of Jesus was pointing forward to all those who would put their trust in Jesus. And he has washed sacrificially their sins away on that cross. But there was another thing that was happening there. It was an example, an object lesson of how we as God's children should relate to one another. We shouldn't boss it over each other. We are to love each other as He has loved us. Our love should be rooted and power, be powered by the love that Jesus has shown to us. That love that we saw displayed on Calvary's cross, giving us what we needed the most when we deserve it the least. And there will be times when you need to love others like that. Even here, in this table, in this, uh, around this table this morning. 
We are not perfect. And when we are to become aware of our sin and the sin of others, you know, the greatest way that we can show God's love to one another is to forgive one another. When we forgive one another as Christ has forgiven us, that is the greatest display of God's love in action. We can only love each other in this way because Jesus first loved us in this way. And all who love in this way, Jesus says, by this, all when men will know. By this kind of love being demonstrated, all people will know that His love is real because they can see it's real in your life. You are a book that speaks about, an open book that speaks about God's love to a watching world. Sometimes to your children, sometimes to your brothers and sisters in Christ. It identifies, this love identifies the true followers of Christ. Our obedience to Christ is a sign and a test of our love for Him. May God by His Spirit continue to help us to do that. And so when Judas, as the Bible says, not Iscariot, said in verse 22, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourselves to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and I too will come, and we will come to make our home with him. What a wonderful picture that is. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Now whenever Jesus points out, as he often does in the Gospel of John, when he says, um, these words are not my own, they are the words of my Father. He is making this point. He's saying, these words that I speak are the very words of God. And when you hear God speak, you better listen and respond. By the way, this means Amen. This means yes. <laughs> Which brings us to a very serious consideration this morning. That Jesus' commands includes all of His teaching, not just some of them. It's only those who believe all His teaching and seek to live in the light of all His teaching that can truly say that they are followers of Christ. True followers. It's impossible to love Jesus. To be part of Jesus, to have His life in us, His Spirit within us, and yet disregard, disrespect, or disbelieve His Word. Can you see that it just doesn't add up? And especially what His Word has to say to us about Jesus. We better make sure that the Jesus that we are serving and following is the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus of our own making. Many people are serving a Jesus of their own making. They, try, they have a tendency to redefine Him according to their tastes and preferences and church traditions and cultural norms. They begin to twist the Jesus of the Bible into someone that they can feel more comfortable with. C.S. Lewis says, you cannot be comfortable with a roaring lion. But people seek to dilute what Jesus says about himself and by what it means to follow him. The cost of following Jesus, we don't take it as seriously as we should. We disregard what he says about those who openly mock him. We disregard his teaching. We claim that they are walking in the light. Yes, they hate their brothers. 
When we begin to do that, when we begin to choose what we like about Jesus' teaching, you know what will happen in the end? We will create a nice, non-offensive, politically correct, middle-class, westernized, woke Jesus. A Jesus of our own making. Who looks like us and thinks like us. But no, none of us can personalize, have a personalized Jesus. We must follow the Jesus of the Bible as He revealed Himself. That's the only Jesus that there is. I like to think of Jesus like this. No, 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 no. What does the Bible tell me about Jesus? Is this the Jesus that you are following? <laughs> Praying to His Father, Jesus said it like this in John 17 verse 6. John 17 verse 6. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. I have revealed you to them. They are yours. You gave them to me. And this is how we know who they are. And they have obeyed your word. Who said that? Who said that? Our Lord Jesus, he said that. This is how you will recognize his followers. Do you get it? Jesus is available and open to all. But it's impossible for us, for anyone to say that he loves Jesus, but live ignoring his teaching. Which teaching? Tell me. Yeah. Number one, he says to us, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. Have you looked around? This is the one another. Our brothers and sisters in Christ. How can we say we love God when we have not seen if we do not love one another that we do see? We are modly bunch, as I said on, earlier on. Having relationships with God's children is sometimes messy. But guess what? They are his children. And he loves them to bits. And he wants us to love them to bits. He commands us to do all of his teachings. Now, immediately after Jesus makes this statement, If you love me, you will keep my commands when he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. You see, Jesus could only be with them one person at a time. But the Holy Spirit can be with everybody of us, with the Christians in Russia, with the Christians in Ukraine, with the Christians in Palestine, with the Christians in, 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 in Creighton, the Holy Spirit can be with us forever. Now Jesus knowing that keeping His commandments in this broken, fallen world of ours will require a divine source of power in the form of the Holy Spirit's presence living within us. He lived in this world. And He came up against the opposition of many, as we will, if we truly live for Him and we live out His word. Which brings us to our second point. Our dependence on the indwelling Holy Spirit. We cannot live this life without His help as we're going to sing later on, one of my favorite songs. And if we want to understand the indwelling with the Holy Spirit, we need to understand who and what it is that the Holy, who the Holy Spirit is and what He does in our lives. Now, I cannot tell you everything there is to be known about the Holy Spirit in this few minutes ahead of us, but I just want to focus on a few points that, uh, that, uh, that John, Jesus' disciple, focuses on in this passage. And you notice that the word in verse 16, the word Holy Spirit or Counselor there is actually the word from the Greek that's called paraclete. And in, when he says just said that he's going to give us another paraclete, it means that he was the first paraclete and that he was going to give us somebody just like him to do in our lives just what he did in our lives. And Jesus on earth, he said, I come to make the Father known to them. And I'm going to show them the way that they can come and be in His eternal dwelling forever. 
And I'm actually going to make the way for them to be able to come there. But the Holy Spirit is going to take over my task in this world as I was a paraclete to them, being outside of them, the Holy Spirit is going to be a paraclete to us being inside of Him, us. And so let's look a bit about how the Holy Spirit was going to do that. The role of the Holy Spirit, which we jump down to verse 6, 26, 14, 26. Jesus says he will teach you, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. He will bring all things to your remembrance that I have said to you. There was a time when Jesus said those words. Do you believe it? Do you believe that that actually happened? Yes. Now many people, when you talk to them like this, they will say when we talk to them about the Bible, they say, how can we know that what Jesus taught 2,000 years ago that is still true today? Have you heard that comment? Now, I would say if you really want to know, let me, let me show you what Jesus shows you and I'll take him to this verse, verse 26. And in this verse, two things are being said. The verse is a promise to two different, of two different things to do two different groups of people. First of all, there's a promise to the apostles and there's then a promise to the church. And to the apostles, it's the promise of inspiration. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, who would supernaturally teach the disciples everything that they needed to teach us, that we need to know about God, that we need how to live for Him in this world, how to prepare for eternity. The Holy Spirit will teach the disciples all of that. And the Holy Spirit will enable to them to supernaturally Record everything that they needed to know in what we have. Hold it up if you've got one there. Your Bible. That is a reliable record. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. That they supernaturally accurately recalled and recorded everything that we need to know and to love and to serve. And one day to be with Him forever face to face. And so when Judas, I say again, not Iscariot, said to Jesus, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus will indeed show himself to the world. But through the teaching that was inspired, an inspiration was given to the Holy Spirit so that they could give us a reliable record of all the things that Jesus said and done that we need to know. The Bible says that everything that Jesus said and done had to be written in books. Be, there would not be enough books to hold it. Think about it. Switch on. Think about it. What, will it be, what good will it be for us if Christ had come to the earth, died in our stead, with God's eternal purposes in mind, rose again three days later, and then for the Holy Spirit to come 50 days later or so, if none of that was recorded for us in the Bible. If we didn't have a Bible, what would you know about Jesus? Would you be listening to what I have to say? I will just be going like this. But what we need to do is to go back to the Bible. This is God's will. This is God's eternal purpose for us. Explained and recorded for us in the Bible. Disciples, it was the promise of inspiration. What about us, the church today? For us, it's a promise of illumination. Now, the promise of illumination, people get that one wrong. This is something very important that we need to understand. So, what the Holy Spirit is doing now is the Holy Spirit gives us understanding and help us to interpret and imply the Word of God that is already once and for all recorded for us. Not to add to it. Not to give us new messages. You know, I, I hope you're not listening to all these 
people that claim they've died and been a, for three years in heaven and they come back and they got a new message to give us. That's not to be found in the Bible. Rubbish! I can't tell you how. You must stay away from that. That's there. In there lies the deception of the evil one. What God wants you to know, He's taken the time to give us the Holy Spirit to put it down in writing. Don't try to add to it. Don't try to take away from it. The end of the Bible in Revelation 22 verse 18 to 19 tells us if we take away or add to what is recorded there, then the plagues of the Bible will be added to your life. And you will not be part of God's eternal um, purposes. Dear friends, if you remember nothing that I've said to you this morning, I want you to remember this. Jesus is not just another religious teacher whose thoughts and opinions we can take or leave according to our preferences. No. Jesus is not just another religious teacher. He says, I've told you all these things that you may know that I am He. That is to say, I am the great I am. I am God. I can, you can trust me. And I've made sure that you, what I've said and who I am, it's all there in the Bible. It's recorded for us there. If we, have, if we are bound to Christ, if His life is in us, His Spirit is in us, then we'll keep His commandments. If we are bound to Christ, then Christ will seek whatever we need from the Father in order to live this life. And the best gift that He could have given us is the Holy Spirit. One like Himself. The Spirit of truth that will help us to show us the truth and to live in the light of that truth. Just as we know our connection with Jesus by believing the way that Jesus lived by obeying His commandments, we know the Spirit. How do we know the Spirit? By living with the truth, living in light of the Scriptures. Listen to me. What breath is to speech, you cannot have speech without breath. This means yes. Think about it. So, you cannot have God's Word without His Spirit. They are linked. We know the Spirit because we know the Word of God and we live according to the Word of God. That's the burden of my message for you this morning. I hope you get it. <clears throat> this is the truth which others may reject or deny, or want to add to or take away from. But the Spirit who lives within us bears witness with our spirit that we are God's children and these are God's truths. You know, during this Olympics, I uh, <clears throat> have seen that there have been occasions when a Christian would have won a medal. Oh, there's been a few of them. And when they were prompted to talk about how they felt about this piece of gold or bronze or silver, whatever was in their hands, guess what? When you bumped the glass, what was inside the glass came out. They made it very evident by what they said, some of them, that what they held in their hand was never to be compared to what they held in their heart. The treasure, the greatest treasure of all. When you bumped them, they spoke about Jesus. Yes. Do you know how people are filled with the Spirit of God? How churches are filled with the Spirit of God? God's, where God's Spirit is evidently present, they will make a big deal of Jesus. Yes. The Holy Spirit's job is to point us to Jesus. Yes. To help us to keep on walking with Jesus. If we are on step with the Spirit of God, we will exalt Jesus in our lives and the way we live. And there's no more incredible display of God's love than his display on Calvary's cross. There he showed us the full extent of his love. And once that love has touched you, your life can never be the same. 
How many of you have seen believers who have and are humbly serving and sacrificing loving others? Where does it come from? It flowed from that cross. If you have loved ones, brothers, sisters, children, grandchildren, neighbors, that you long in your heart, the thing, the greatest longing that you have in your heart for them is that they may know this life transforming love of Jesus. If that is what is on your, going on in your heart, if this is the reason why you're living, can I tell you something? That's a sure sign that Jesus is indeed the treasure of your heart and that the Holy Spirit is living there. The Holy Spirit will always point us to Jesus. You know, sometimes you come across preachers and they're so full of themselves. They're the hero of their preaching and their ministry. But the Holy Spirit, where He's present, Jesus is the hero and the treasure of our lives. One such preacher was Charles Spurgeon, that, um, that was a wonderful man, a man of preacher of years of day gone by. And he used to say that he was a Baptist. Sorry for you that are not Baptist here today. But um, <clears throat> he said, Sometimes I wonder that you do not get tired of my preaching, and he had thousands coming to listen to him. Because I do nothing but hammer away at this one nail. This one nail is the glorious news that our blessed God and Savior, Jesus Christ, paid it all for us. And in our response, we will show that He is worthy of our highest devotion and our greatest service. Friends, I want to say to you, there's a roaring lion out there. The days in which we are living are evil. He's seeking whom he can devour and destroy. Ephesians 5, verse 15 to 20. I just want to read you these five verses. So be very careful how you live, not being like those who have no understanding, but live honorably with true wisdom, for we are living in evil times. Yes? Take full advantage of every day as you have spent your life for His purposes. Are you spending your life for His purposes? And don't live foolishly, for then you will be, have discernment to fully understand God's will. Where was God's will come from? His word. And don't get drunk with wine, which is rebellion. Instead, be filled continually with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be filled with His, with His word. Living that word. The word and the spirit of God. One. Always giving thanks to the Father. For every person he brings into your life in the name of Jesus Christ. Your brothers and sisters in Christ. The last, your neighbors. Why does God bring this person into my life? For his eternal purposes. He's counting on me to put a stone in his shoe to tell him about Jesus. And out of your reverence for Christ, be supportive of each other in love. There's an allegory told by John Bunyan in the Pilgrim's Progress. Maybe you know about that one. The Pilgrim's Progress is a very good book to read. You can actually have it read for you on YouTube on, 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 and so on. And it talks about a man called Christian that's on his way. He's left the city of destruction, this world, and he's now on his way to heaven, the celestial, the celestial city. At one point in the story, he's headed towards a place of rest and safety for travelers. It's called the Palace Beautiful. Standing before him are two roaring lions. They are ferocious. What is he going to do? And then Christian comes to a realization by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. They are actually chained. They can only go so far. And no further. They can go, they can come with their roars and their threats and whatever, their teeth, they can do it all. They can, but they can only go so far. 
And then, friend, that's a powerful way for us to think about our fears, the fears in our lives. They may roar and intimidate, but if we are in Christ, they will not be finally there. They cannot hurt us. I am selling myself when visiting somebody now that is getting like me and you, maybe, elderly. And when things, when we get elderly, we can be prone to listen to the roars of the lion that want to destroy us. You start believing lies like this. You are all alone. Have you heard that one? There is no one to help. Disaster is inevitable. You can't trust all his word. Nothing can overcome or help you to overcome your failures, your weaknesses. And the more we repeat those things, they grow disproportionately large when compared to reality. We start believing the lies rather than the reality of God's word. The governing reality of our lives must be God's word. These other things may be true. There may be truth that we are getting older. And there be times when we are alone, but we're lonely, but we never have to be alone. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Did he say that? Yes. Bang on it. He's there. Talk to him. He says, if the Holy Spirit is at work like this in our lives, John says, peace, Jesus says, I love you. Peace, I leave with you. My peace I give you. Do not let, do not give, I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look in fully to his wonderful face. And the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Daily you have the opportunity to make space. For God in your life. As you read God's word, you can say, Holy Spirit, please come and help me to see your eternal purposes for me in Jesus more clearly this morning. Help me to love him more dearly. Help me to follow him more nearly. That's how you stay on this narrow road. While you're on this narrow road, in the middle of that road, in the center of God's will, obeying His word, the evil one cannot destroy you. Jesus will fulfill His purposes. If you love me, keep my commandments. Let's pray. <coughs> Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for what we could have learned this morning. Help us to take your word, the written word, seriously, so that we can take the living word, Jesus, seriously. We pray for this, and we thank you that you have begun a good work in us, and you are busy completing it. Thank you, Lord. Amen. <coughs>